Remember this, the Secret Service agents made a human shield around the president. In fact, they're obliged to save the POTUS even at the cost of their own lives. But what about those lapel pins? Oh, how about the breath mints they carry? According to the agency's database, over 7,000 Secret Service agents are working for the agency as of 2019. But don't be fooled into thinking they're all tasked with protecting the president. About 3,200 of them are special agents, and a small part of these make up the Presidential Protection Division. The rest of these 3,200 that aren't protecting the president are carrying out investigations and general protection missions. About 1,300 of them are uniformed division officers. These are the agents you see protecting the White House and other venues. The rest of them are working as technical and professional agents behind closed doors. Despite a large number of Secret Service agent positions, becoming a part of this elite organization is harder than you may think. Every year, about 15,000 people apply to become special agents, and only about 150 of them, or 1%, get accepted. Every person applying for a position must be a U.S. citizen, have a driver's license, be in excellent physical condition, be between 21 and 37 years old, undergo extensive background investigations, interviews, drug screening, and polygraph examination. After this comes the hard part. In the next 31 weeks, each of the participants receive extensive training. The first phase is the CITP, or Criminal Investigator Training Program, and the second phase is the Special Agent Training Course. The very same day President Lincoln was assassinated, on April 14, 1865, the POTUS signed the legislation enacting the agency that would later become the U.S. Secret Service. But even if Lincoln had signed the law earlier, he still wouldn't have received protection from the Secret Service. They were intended to be a part of the Treasury Department to fight counterfeit currency in the U.S. and remained in this role until 2003. You would think that after the assassination of President Lincoln, they'd improve the security team around the head of state. But no, it took another assassination to task the Secret Service with presidential protection. In 1901, after the assassination of President William McKinley, the agency smashed that like button, just like you should if you haven't done so already. But no, in all seriousness, the agency offered full-time presidential protection from the following year. And in 1908, they also added mandatory protection for the president-elect. Because Secret Service agents need to be outgoing and seem friendly whenever they question the locals, they must present their best side. After all, one female agent summed it up best when she said, they're not going to want to talk to you if you have bad breath. They clam up. They shut up. Part of being a good communicator is people wanting to speak with you, and if your breath stinks, no one wants to talk to you. In addition to this, they also carry a notebook, mechanical pencils, a portable charger, a mini CPR kit, a flashlight, a multi-tool, and hand sanitizing wipes. It might seem like a staggering sum of money, but the Department of Homeland Security has an annual budget of $75 million. Before 1997, there was a law that stated every former president and their spouse would receive Secret Service protection for 10 years after their retirement. But all of that changed in 2012 when the former President's Protection Act was changed. This meant that starting from President George W. Bush, the President and their spouse would be protected for life. The people that the Secret Service agents protect are called charges. However, there are strict guidelines that every agent has to abide by when it comes to protecting their charges. One of the most important rules is about not forming close personal relationships with the people they're protecting, as it's believed this would cloud the agent's judgment. In fact, when Carol Leoning and Trump's daughter Tiffany were seen spending too much time in private together, the agency had to step in. They assigned Leoning a new charge and the two were questioned. Both of them denied any allegations and stated that their relationship was only professional. If you look closely, you'll notice that all Secret Service agents wear peculiar lapel badges. Well, we now know that they're not just a patriotic symbol. In 2019, a company called Blackington & Company was paid over $6.7 million to make, manufacture, and deliver badges. But there are no ordinary badges. These are Smart Shield badges. Each of them has a small chip inside that connects to a database at the agency. The chip sold all the information about the agent, and with one quick scan, they'll know if someone is trying to infiltrate their ranks or not. But weren't we talking about lapel pins? With a staggering sum of $6.7 million, it's assumed that the lapel pins have the same function as the badges. This means anyone trying to pretend to be a Secret Service agent better watch out. This is a tradition going back to Woodrow Wilson and the Secret Service. Namely, during their time in office, the chargers of the Secret Service have special code names. For example, Donald Trump and Melania were called Mogul and Muse. 
George H.W. Bush and Barbara Bush were Timberwolf and Snowbank. Bill and Hillary Clinton were Eagle and Evergreen, while Michelle and Barack Obama were called Renegade and Renaissance. And many times, even the children of the POTUS have code names. Maybe that's why they're always talking into the palm of their hand, or trying to remember all those different names. Back in 2008, Alberto Gonzalez was arrested. The reason? He stole about 130 million credit card numbers. It was the largest retail store theft in history, and he received a 20-year sentence. However, it was later found out that those 20 years were just a cover-up, and he was working for the Secret Service the entire time. What was he doing? Well, since he was an expert bank card stealer, Gonzalez was tasked with finding other bank card thieves. For his loyal service, the criminal mastermind was paid $75,000 because they didn't want people tracing the money to Gonzalez. All of the payments were made in cash. If you're looking for someone who can detect a liar, then look no further than the Secret Service Forensic Laboratory. They have special polygraph programs that some of the agents have to undergo. After they finish the program, they're considered, and we quote, experts in the psychology of deception. Nothing escapes their scrutinizing examinations. In that same lab, the Secret Service also has 15,000 samples of different ink types to analyze forged documents. The agents who are given the task of protecting the president at all costs need to be trained in 10-minute medicine. What's that? Well, in the unfortunate event the president is injured, the Secret Service agents have to provide first aid to the president until trained doctors and nurses can provide medical care. Sometimes keeping the president alive means giving him a transfusion, which is why the Secret Service agents protecting the president carry vials of blood. If you manage to make it past the 1% of applicants, pass all the screening and background checks, and then endure the grueling 31-week training, then you've officially become a Secret Service agent. You'll get to wear black suits and sunglasses, and you're constantly communicating through the little antenna in your ear. Sometimes a Secret Service agent will have to dress casually to blend in with the crowd. Websites indicate Secret Service agent salary is between $145,000 and $151,000 per year. Finally, the saddest fact of all is that since 1902, the year the Secret Service was established, a total of 37 officers have died in the line of duty, four of which were women. In 2018, Secret Service agent Noel E. Remigan died of a stroke while protecting John Bolton, the National Security Advisor. The most gruesome of all losses happened in Oklahoma on April 19, 1995. During the bombing, six agents lost their lives in the Alfred P. Murrah Federal Building. Before that, on March 5, 1983, another three agents traveling to protect Queen Elizabeth II in Yosemite National Park lost their lives. Bye for now.